This is an eight day old baby bunny. And bunny rabbits have a nerve in their back. And when you hold them a certain way and turn them over, that nerve causes them to just go to sleep. Kind of knocks them out. <laughs> there he is, knocked out. Hey Internet, it is Tuesday, the 7th of December. We are well into the second Sunday of Advent, the new year of the church, which begins with us looking forward by looking back to understand the fulfillment of God's promises of a Messiah, of a seed born of woman who would crush the head of the serpent, that ancient foe, the dragon, and how all of this messianic promise of a kingdom and reign of God restored to paradise, Eden forever, which will come at the end of time, came just a little bit early in time the flesh and blood of our incarnate Lord Jesus of Nazareth. And so, we are turning our eyes toward Bethlehem as a church year, and to do so, in Matthew's Gospel, which we will be studying through this church year, this idea of the reign of God is being focused in and narrowed down by the one who came first to prepare that way of the Lord for us to hear, St. John the Baptizer. Because sadly, Baptist means something different these days, doesn't it? Last week, we heard about John the Baptizer from Matthew chapter 3. And this week, we're jumping ahead to Matthew chapter 11, where once again, John the Baptist shows up as a central player in what it means to have the reign of God happening in Jesus. And something that's really key to your future study of the book of Matthew is to see that Matthew is divided into three major parts, along with two little capstone endings, a prologue and an epilogue. The prologue is what we focus on during Christmas time, the epilogue is the so-called Great Commission, the institution of holy baptism, where God sends the pastoral ministry to baptize and teach all things for the sake of the building up of the saints. Those two pieces sit on the end, and then there are three major sections in the book, and the key to being able to find these sections and know how they're doing what they're doing in a sort of repetitive pattern is, of all people, John the Baptist. And so in Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist comes proclaiming, prepare the way of the Lord with the spirit of Elijah. And then then Jesus shows up and is baptized and the way of the Lord begins, the reign of God preaching miracles. End of the world paradise come early. This goes on for a while and Jesus is quite received as he heals many. He predicts opposition but you don't really see it yet. Matthew chapter 11 signals this shift from Jesus preaching and healing ministry without opposition to Jesus preaching and healing ministry facing increased opposition and it is tipped off and turned by the appearance once again of none other than Saint John the Baptist. So from this point on, this marker in the center of the text, Jesus will increasingly face opposition. And we see here, whereas John initially came and is received by the people, this text sees John facing opposition. Not only in terms of recognizing he has been put into change by King Herod for what he has preached, but on top of that, that he himself is no longer so certain that this Messiah is the one he had been waiting for. John was, among women, born the greatest, and yet he was still therefore among women born a sinner. A man, a human, like you or me. And even then, as a saved believing Christian, a saint and sinner, whose doubts plagued him, and the more that he looked at his change in his bonds, the vocation of his life, which didn't go the way he wanted, but was a cross, the more he was forced to ask, where are you, God? What are you doing for me? Because the gospel that Jesus was doing as reign of God didn't seem to be enough, if briefly. There is, by the way, a third section which comes around in chapter 17, where we turn from Jesus being received to Jesus finding opposition to Jesus going to the cross. And it hinges right where he says, I will go to the cross, and then the next thing that happens is the mountain of transfiguration, which might not seem at first glance to be a John the Baptist marker, except remember that John the Baptist in chapter 3 comes in the spirit of Elijah, and although we do not hear about Elijah in chapter 11, where we hear of John, on the mountain of transfiguration, guess who shows up? Once more to let us know that there is a major shift and turn taking place. The reign of God which has come in Jesus, which makes the deaf to speak, the blind to see, the lame to walk, is not in and of itself an in time and space thing for this Israel only, but is something bigger. It is this Emmanuel, this God with us, dying on a cross and rising from that grave for the sake of the sins of the entire world. Your problem is not the bondage of chains that you have in your vocational life. Your problem is the bondage of chains which are 
upon your heart, rotten to the core with the fleshly spirit that desires to be God and not trust God. That's what really we needed to be saved from. That's a whole heap of a lot of context to this section, but hopefully it shows you how smart Matthew was. My goodness. But we are then in chapter 11, this second marker turning towards opposition which Jesus will face. Chapter 11 verse 2 then continues, Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Cool Greek word there for prison, desmoterio, maybe literally translated as as the place of bondage again. And while we certainly don't want to spiritualize this too much, for John was a very real man in a very real prison, his experience was one which was common to us all. It's sometimes a little bit difficult to get close and cuddly with that guy dressed in camel's hair eating locusts in the wilderness, but every single one of us knows what it feels like to have the walls creeping in on our lives, feeling that what we do does not have enough purpose, strength, or ability. That no matter what we strive to achieve, it always falls short. That though we wish for glory, what we find instead as a cross. This is what St. John the Baptist now is enduring and it causes him, according to his flesh, to have the same experience you and I do. To wonder, oh Lord, what are you doing? Are you the one or shall we wait for another? The word wait there in the Greek is prosdokomen. It's related to the docetic controversies in the early church, the dokeo, to appear, to seem. And so to translate it as waiting for really gives it a little more power than maybe is just built into the text, although certainly contextually this makes sense. But think in terms of expecting or thinking thinking about or looking towards. This is the kind of waiting that's going on. And John wants to know, is it over? And in one sense, the answer is absolutely and unequivocally yes. So Jesus answers them, these disciples. As you journey, tell John. By the way, parallel structure to as you go, baptize all nations and teach. It's a participle in the Greek. It is not an imperative. Very important. English, we kind of screw that up. The chief point of the Great Commission is not go. It's baptize and teach. Right here, the chief part of what Jesus says to the disciples of John is not go back to John. Duh. Uh, they're going to do that. <laughs> it's tell John this. Tell him what you hear and what you see. And now he makes reference to everything that's gone on before this point in Matthew's narrative, where what is being received by the people of Israel are the marks of the reign of God. Blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Leopards are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel heralded to them. It's really easy to go over those awful quickly and not catch the full impact of what's happening. This is the kind of reality experience that you or I have never ever seen. And if we sit down and think about it with our modern minds, we would say, this is simply a joke. It's impossible. Here's a guy walking around the entire countryside, flicking away every affliction of this life with his words. It always blows my mind that people struggle with six-day creation or the story of Jonah, but want to claim that they trust that Jesus is the incarnate Son of God. Are you kidding me? This is like the most impossible sounding thing you could ever imagine. There was a little girl who had just died, and he walked in and he said, she's not dead, she's just asleep. And everyone laughs at the man. But but here's the thing. He raises the girl from the dead. He makes a lame man to walk and at the same moment says, oh, by the way, I can forgive sins too. The skeptics like that even less than the walking. So Jesus is telling these followers of John to tell John, what do you see? Are these not the Isaionic prophecies, the Old Testament prophecies about what will happen when the Messiah comes? And note the descent in strength of signs, from blind being able to see and the deaf being able to hear, which sounds pretty darn impossible, to the dead being raised, which sounds even more darn impossible, too that height and pinnacle of all unbelievable things, the preaching. That's the big one, by the way. You will do even greater things than these. You will herald law and gospel, which will transform and regenerate the true bondage man's heart. Whoa. But speaking of signs, and which reminds me, this also should point out to us, John the Baptist's own little issue here, just how without value or aid signs, miracles, wonders, and experience actually is. Remember, this is the guy who was baptizing in the water and the sky ripped in half and God came down as a bird and like spoke to them and stuff. And here he is being like, well, maybe Maybe I remembered it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe my experience wasn't as authentic as I thought. Experiential, entirely subjective, what I see will never last. And though an evil generation asks for a sign, no sign is given but the sign of Jonah. Oh, by the way, that's coming in a chapter. The death and resurrection of Christ and his preached gospel is the one and only proof. When you're sitting in prison, no previous experience is enough. And if you don't believe me, well, ask John the Baptist. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed?
Reed is shaking in the wind? The implied answer is no. What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in effeminate clothing? Greek word there is malakois. It can mean either soft, effeminate, or homosexual when applied to a man's action with another man. Did you go out to see a soft man in this wilderness? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. The implied answer again is no, that's not what they went out to see. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. Nigh! I tell you and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. And as he says in verse 14, and if you can accept it, if you are able to receive it, if you dare to believe it, this man, John, is Elijah, the one holding the mantle of the prophet who prepares the way of God, who is to come before the end of the world. He who has ears, that is he who believes, hear this. Amen, I say to you, Jesus goes on, among those born of women, of the seed of woman, there has arisen no one greater than John the baptizer. This is to say that until this time in history, there has been no more righteous man than John. This is a left-hand issue. He kept the Ten Commandments. He carried the mantle of prophet. He loved his neighbor as himself, as good as any of us will ever do. He had faith, love, and trust, fear before the Lord with all his heart and all his soul and all his might. And yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Because he was a sinner. Because the value of a man or a woman in the church is not about how great they are, but about how great their God who reigns is. And in this sense, there is really only one who is in the kingdom and reign of God, and he is the least who is the greatest. He is the crucified one who is the resurrected one never to die again. Faith alone saves. There is no law, gospel, law in this, but the reality that when we're talking about justification and how you know you stand before God, I don't care if you're John the Baptist, Saint Mary, or Mother Teresa, the infant baptized is greater than you. With regards to righteousness before God, the mountains have been brought low and the valleys have been raised up and there is a straight path, a one way, a single man who is enough. Trusting in him is all in all. And such trust cannot be earned, merited, or taken by force. From the days when John first came baptizing until now, Jesus says, the reign of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Even from the beginning, the Pharisees, scribes, and piously righteous men are attempting to demonstrate their worth and value before God to earn for themselves the approval and pleasure of the Lord, and to say, we are worthy, but that is not faith. And as such, all their righteous deeds were but filthy rags. But the reign of heaven, the righteous one who acts to save, both then with deeds of miracles, and now with the miracle of preaching, and in the day to come, when what we hear and believe by faith will become what we see and experience by sight, everlastingly and eternally, so that no doubt shall ever shake us like reeds in the wind. No lust of luxury shall ever deceive us away. As the prophet Isaiah says, even a fool shall never stumble or be deceived. <sighs> good news for me. All of this is because the least in the reign of heaven is one body, part and partial, united eternally to the new root from the stump of Jesse, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He who has ears let him hear. So hey, yeah, a little bookkeeping, housekeeping for you here. It is nearly Christmas time, and lest you have forgotten the Grandpa's Church Tees, the original confessional gangster tee, and the vintage tees are all still available from Spreadshirt.com, and proceeds of every portion goes to help support the show and Lutherans in Africa. And also, you can at this next site, which there's a link below, woohoo, also find Christmas cards. What better thing to tell someone that you are wishing them a Merry Christmas than by giving them the gift of Worldview Everlasting which, as we all know, ain't about anything but Jesus. If you want to go back to the law as your source of hope and joy after you have received this blessing, this makarit'oi, this heralded proclaimed gospel, now you got something seriously wrong with you. Not saying that the law ain't good is great stuff. We uphold the law. We are no longer under it. Switching. I'm over, he wakes up. Hello, Neil.